Sarah Zapata, Z-A-P-A-T-A. Hey, Agent Zapata, I think we have a, I guess, what, what would you call that, a container of, is that your notes up there? Yes, my case file and um, other relevant documents. Okay, to, to aid you in your testimony if necessary? Yes. Um, could you tell the jurors where you work? I work for the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division, commonly known as SLED. And how long have you worked for SLED? For about seven and a half years. What is your job title there? I am a forensic scientist in the DNA casework department. What are some of your um, duties as a forensic scientist in DNA? Um, as a DNA analyst, I um, will look at the request for different items of evidence. I can perform serology testing if necessary or refer to the serologist results. Um, I will take the items of evidence as well as any known standards through our standard laboratory procedures to develop a DNA profile. Um, the steps of that analysis are extraction, which is where we are trying to isolate any DNA present on that evidence item from the evidence item itself. As well Agent, as if you could pull the microphone to pick up a little bit. Sure, Thank sorry. Um, as well as from um, any other cellular material present. The second step is quantitation, where we're trying to approximate how much DNA is present on that sample so that we can target the appropriate amount of DNA for the next step, which is amplification. Um, amplification works kind of like a chemical copy machine. We're targeting specific areas of the DNA that have been shown through scientific studies to vary from person to person. And we're trying to make copies of that so that it can be detected by our final instrument, which is what actually separates the DNA into a profile. And then I will interpret that profile and calculate any statistics and prepare a report I can also perform technical and administrative reviews of other analysts' work, as well as testify in court when necessary. Okay. And can you tell us a little about your educational background and training that qualify you for this position? I have a Bachelor of Science in Forensic Science from the Pennsylvania State University. Upon employment at SLED, I underwent a training program for approximately a year and a half under a qualified DNA analyst. And that training included an observation period as well as a practical period of the different steps in our DNA analysis process as well as the serology procedures. Um, once I had received all of my training, I went through a testing period where I had to um, demonstrate my competency in using all those different instruments and procedures and interpretation. I had to successfully complete several written exams, an oral exam, complete several mock cases and a mock court, and then um, was competency tested with another case before finally being able to do a mock case, before finally being able to do analysis on real casework. Okay. You will need to speak into the mic and increase your volume in order for us to hear you better. May proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Agent Zapata, how many um, cases have you, um, do you think you've participated in? Approximately 500. And have you testified in trial before? Yes, I have. How many times? 19. And um, in those trials, were you qualified as an expert witness? Yes, I was. Um, and what were you qualified as an expert witness in? In DNA analysis. Your Honor, at this time, the state would move to qualify um, Agent Zapata as an expert in DNA analysis. Okay. She's so All right. Um, you had mentioned in some of the duties of your job, kind of what you do. I guess if we could kind of scale it back a little bit more basic, but briefly, <laughs> um, just what is DNA? DNA is a chemical that is found throughout your body with the exception of red blood cells. Um, you get half of your DNA from your mom and half from your dad, and it's unique to individuals with the exception of identical twins. And so if we have a case where there are family members involved, um, what does that mean as far as DNA analysis? 
Based upon the evidence DNA profile, um, sometimes it might not be possible to make comparisons to some family members because there may not be enough DNA present there to distinguish between the family members. Um, because the family members will share DNA, that will affect what the DNA profile looks like. Can you tell us about some different sources of DNA from a person's body? Um, some sources from your body would be your hair, blood, um, semen, saliva, bones, um, as well as DNA from your skin cells, which is what we call touch DNA. And what are some variables that can affect touch DNA? So some people just naturally shed more skin cells throughout the day than other people, and so you would expect to recover more DNA from an object that a person who sheds a lot of DNA has handled than a person who sheds less. Um, there are also factors such as the surface that is being touched. If the surface is rough, then you would leave more skin cells behind. If you are holding the item for a longer period of time or with a lot of pressure, then you would expect to leave more skin cells behind. Um, environmental factors such as rain, moisture, UV, light, that can all um, lessen the amount of DNA that is recovered. Um, and also personal hygiene habits can affect how much DNA you leave behind. So if you've just washed your hands, there may not be as much skin cells left behind. So do you leave touch DNA behind kind of like you would leave a fingerprint behind? Is that fair comparison? Kind of. If you touch it, you touch an object, you may leave some behind. All right. Now you mentioned um, different sources such as body fluids. Um, are you able to confirm like 100% which body fluid a DNA profile comes from? So the test that we perform to try to identify a body fluid is different from the DNA testing that is being performed. Um, especially in cases where the evidence profile is a mixture, there's no way for us to tell did all of this DNA come from blood? Did it come from saliva and blood mixed together? There's no way for us to identify 100% um, the source of the DNA profile. We can indicate that a body fluid may be present, but we cannot say the blood on this item is from this individual. So if I had a drop of blood on my shirt up here, could you ever say this was my blood? I could test it um, for the, ind the indication of a body fluid. I could see if your DNA profile um, is recovered from that stain, if the evidentiary DNA profile, um, if you are included as a contributor to that profile, but I can never 100% say that is your blood. So you could say my DNA is here, but not my blood. I could say that you're included as a contributor to the <laughs> DNA profile. Okay. All right, and I think you kind of already explained your process of um, DNA analysis when you explained um, your duties. Can you tell us about some of the, you know, standard lab procedures and protocol? How specifically do you mean? I mean, I guess just basically how you analyze a DNA sample. So I will take the DNA sample if it has been previously cut by a serologist or an evidence processor. I will add the reagents to the tube um, and proceed with my analysis that way. If it has not previously been cut, then I can prepare the sample for DNA and then take it through those steps that I explained earlier, so extraction, quantitation, amplification, and separation into a profile. And then I will interpret the DNA profile that was developed. So I will determine um, if there is enough DNA present there for the profile to be used for comparison. Um, I will determine the number of contributors to that profile. So a profile can be single source which is DNA from just one individual or a mixture, DNA from multiple individuals are present in the profile. I'll determine um, if it's a mixture, how many people are in that mixture or how many I'm interpreting that mixture as. 
and then um, I can calculate statistics to compare. So first, first of all, let me stop you for a minute. Sorry. But these determinations, how are you making the determinations? So I'm looking at the DNA profile and using our protocol, our procedures, my training and experience as a DNA analyst to determine the number of contributors to the profile. And are you, how are you looking at it? Are, are you visually looking at it or is a computer program looking at it or what's going on there? So I visually examine the profile myself as the analyst. I determine the number of contributors to the profile. And then we also use a software program called StarMix to help in our interpretation. And what StarMix does is look at the evidence profile and attempt to break it down into the potential contributors to that profile. So if you think about the evidence profile as like grandma's chocolate chip cookies, you know exactly what that cookie is supposed to taste like. You know what the final product is supposed to be, and you're trying to recreate that recipe and get it as close to grandma's cookie as what you know it's supposed to be. So you're testing different ingredients at different proportions to see what can make up that cookie. And that is kind of what StarMix does when it's looking at the profile. And then um, I will evaluate the StarMix output, make sure that what StarMix is telling me makes sense based upon what the profile looks like. And then if everything worked properly, I can use StarMix also to calculate our statistics. Okay, and, and how do you calculate that statistic? So the statistic that StarMix calculates is called a likelihood ratio. It's a comparison of two possible scenarios to see which is a better explanation of the DNA profile that was developed. It works kind of like a seesaw. So it, you have one scenario on one side and another scenario on the other side. And StarMix is going to put more weight on the scenario that is a better explanation of the DNA profile. You do these kinds of comparisons subconsciously in your mind all day long. If um, the DNA profile, for example, is um, the fact that someone ran a marathon, that's your result. The two scenarios that could explain that result are, one, the person trained every day for months leading up to the marathon. They ran many, many miles. The second scenario is that they sat on the couch and watched TV and never ran at all. Um, which one is a more likely explanation of the fact that they finished the marathon? It would be the first one, that they trained really hard. And so that is the kind of comparison that StarMix is making. And, and where do these scenarios come from, I guess? So based upon what the DNA profile looks like, we will set up um, the two opposing scenarios to make the comparison. And the first scenario is always going to include the person whose standard is being compared to that profile, so the person whose statistic you are calculating. And the second scenario is always going to include an unidentified, unrelated individual because you need something that opposes that comparison. So for a single source profile, your two scenarios will be the person being compared is contributing to the mixture versus an unidentified, unrelated individual is contributing to the mixture. If it, or sorry, to the profile for a single source. Um, if it is a mixture, then you need to account for the other potential individuals present in that profile. So for a two person mixture, for example, the first scenario will be the person being compared and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture versus two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And so we'll make that same comparison for each person based upon what the DNA profile looks like. Okay. And so this unidentified, unrelated individual, where does that really come from? That's just the way that the statistic is calculated. It's not saying that it's not possible for related individuals to be in the mixture, but because we are focusing only on the comparison to that one person, we need something to contrast that to, and we account for that by using that unidentified, unrelated individual wording. So is that just kind of built into this formula in the StarMix program? <clears throat> Correct. All right. So what are some results that you can obtain from your comparisons you make? So a result in support of the first scenario, which is 
that the person being compared to the profile is contributing to the profile, the seesaw will tilt in that direction and we call that an inclusion. If um, it is tilting far enough in the other direction, we call that an exclusion. It's saying that the person being compared is not a contributor to the profile under those two scenarios that are being compared. It's possible for the seesaw to just tilt a little bit in either direction if the DNA in the profile um, is very low level or very partial. There's just not that much information there to make the comparison and so it's not tilting um, in one way or the other very strongly. It is also possible if it's very partial, very low level information for the seesaw to just not move at all. It's saying that um, neither explanation is a better explanation for the DNA profile and we'll call that um, uninformative. And do you set up um, propositions the same way for each comparison to an item? Yes, so first we will say if the item is suitable for comparison, then we will say the number of contributors that we are interpreting that profile as, and then we will set up those two scenarios each time. Um, in the cases of items that are being taken off of someone's body or swabs from their body, we'll call that an intimate item. And so we want to account for um, the presence of the individual whose body the item was taken off of in that profile. Because it's being removed from their body, we're expecting that profile to be there. And so um, we can do that in two ways. We'll look at the DNA profile. If their DNA is clearly present in the profile, we will assume them as a contributor. And what that does is put that person on both sides of the seesaw. And so we're only making comparisons now to the DNA that is not that person who we already know is there. It's like someone telling you, I know there are two cups of flour in grandma's cookie recipe. So now you're just adjusting the other potential ingredients to see what else is making up that recipe. If their DNA profile is maybe more partial or low level, then we'll run the statistic for that individual first to make sure that it meets our threshold to put them on both sides of the seesaw, and we'll call that a conditioned contributor. It treats it the same way once we've run that standard um, comparison. And so the propositions will list any individual that has been assumed or conditioned on as a contributor, and then it will have the two opposing scenarios for the other individuals that are being compared to the profile, and then finally the result of that comparison. So if you had my shirt for testing, you would assume my DNA was on this shirt because you knew I was wearing the shirt. Right. I would look at your profile first and visually compare that to the item of evidence. If you are clearly um, contributing to the mixture, then I will assume you. If maybe you are a lower level contributor, but it looks like your DNA profile could be there, then in order to confirm that, I will run your statistic first and then continue on with you on both sides of the seesaw. All right, and now are there some times where you are unable to make comparisons to specific individuals? Um, yes, like we mentioned earlier, if um, there are individuals that are related and maybe the DNA profile that we're comparing them to is lower level or there's just not a lot of information there for a lower level contributor, um, we can't distinguish between them and so we won't make comparisons in those cases to those individuals. And I guess before we get started, just kind of going back to DNA in general, um, what are alleles? So alleles are the results of our testing um, at a specific location. Like I explained earlier, the final step of the laboratory portion of our analysis is the separation of the DNA into a profile, and the separation is what generates those allele results. Okay. And how many alleles are we dealing with when you're making an analysis with DNA? I guess if there are more or less, what that can tell you, if that makes sense? I'm not sure I know what you're asking. <laughs> All right, well, sometimes our DNA samples, you mentioned lower or higher <coughs> levels of DNA there. Mm -hmm. Would that affect the alleles that are there? Yes, so the alleles are the actual result that we're looking at. It's the DNA profile that we're looking at. Um, 
we are evaluating the profile based upon the heights of those alleles. So the higher the allele, um, the potential greater contribution of that individual's DNA, the lower level the allele, the less um, DNA potentially from that individual in that profile. And if you only have a few alleles to look at, is that very informative in your analysis? No, the fewer number of alleles that you have to make comparisons, um, the less informative the statistic is going to be. So that's where we have it in that range where it's not tilting greatly in one direction over the other. It's kind of like trying to identify something based off of an eyewitness description. If it's very vague, like it was a red sedan, there are many red sedans that could fit that description. Um, so that would be an example of having a few alleles. But if you have a more specific description, like it was a red sedan with five bumper stickers and a bedazzled license plate, that's very specific. And so you're, you have more information to make your comparison to that vehicle. Unrelated people share the same alleles. Yes. All right, so before we get to the results, some of these statistical results are very large numbers. Is that right? Yes. Um, do you think these two charts here, states exhibit 475 and 474, um, would help demonstrate to the jury what we're talking about. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. um, states exhibit 474 and 475 for demonstrative purposes. No objection. Admit it. Yes, I did. Um, do you remember how many buckle swabs a man received? I believe there were 24 buckle swabs total for com that I used for comparison. Maybe 25? I'd have to count. Um, there was one that I received, but I did not perform analysis on. Maybe that's the one that you're counting. We'll have you take a look at tanks 463. Do you recognize that buckle swab? Yes. And who is that a buckle swab from? Um, it's labeled as buckle swabs from Nolan Tootin. There is um, our laboratory case number and item number on the packaging. And you perform analysis on this buckle swab? Yes. State would move 463 into evidence. No objection. Admit it. Now, um, you compared standards from these buckle swabs to swabs from items of evidence, or how, what do we do to analyze all this stuff? So first we do our interpretation of the evidence. 
Um, we look at the evidence like I described earlier, make sure that it's suitable for comparison, determine the number of contributors to the item, and then um, if it's an intimate item, we'll make that visual comparison to the individual whose uh, body that item came from first. Then we will use StarMix to calculate the statistics for other individuals for comparison, and then um, it'll be a result in support of one proposition over the other. And the other individuals for comparison would be um, any number of the individuals whose vocal swabs were submitted in this case? Yes. All right, I'm going to have you take a look at State's Exhibit 459. Is, is Texas Exhibit 459 an item that you analyzed? 459 are our laboratory items 7.1 and 10.1. Okay. And what, can you tell us what that actually is? Um, 7.1 was the MBAC collection from cartridge cases 2 through 7. And 10.1 were the swabs from the exterior of items 9 and 10, which were um, shotgun shells. And you por performed analysis on both of those items? Yes, I did. Okay. Can you tell us um, the results of your analysis on the MBAC collection from the um, 300 blackout cases, your item 7.1? And I guess instead of just blanketly asking for the results, I'll ask, um, based on the comparisons you made when analyzing that item, were any individuals included? Yes. For item 7.1, the DNA profile was interpreted as single source. And for the comparison to Margaret Murdoch, the two scenarios were Margaret Murdoch contributed the DNA profile versus an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the DNA profile. And the result of that comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 510 billion times more likely if Margaret Murdoch contributed the profile than if an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. And what does that mean? Um, it means that the um, likelihood ratio is in support of that first scenario um, of Margaret Murdoch um, contributing the profile. Um, versus an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. Okay, let's move on to the next item in that exhibit, in State's Exhibit 459, the swabs from the exterior of items 9 and 10, which were these shotgun shells from the fever. Okay. Uh, based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? This item was also interpreted as single source, and so the scenarios were set up the same way with the person being compared contributed the profile versus an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. And that means there's one person contributing. Correct. Um, for Paul Murdaugh, the result of the comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 15 octillion times more likely if Paul Murdaugh contributed the profile than if an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. And what does that mean? Um, just like earlier, it's in support of that first proposition set. Um, the DNA profile is approximately 15 octillion times more likely if Paul Murdoch contributed the profile, then if an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. Let's move on to Exhibit 18. Which are swabs from the feed room door. Did you analyze um, those items? Take exhibit 18. Um, yes, I did. Item 17, you can see our laboratory number and then my initials on the seal. 
and the date. And those are swabs from the feed room door. It's labeled as swabs from exterior doorknob of storage room door. All right. And um, based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? For item 17, um, the comparison with Paul Murdaugh, um, the DNA profile was again interpreted as single source, so we're setting up the propositions in that same way. Um, the result is the DNA profile is approximately 15 octillion times more likely if Paul Murdaugh contributed the profile than if an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. 15 octillion times more likely. An octillion has 27 zeros. Yes. So that's a pretty high statistical number there. Yes. Let's move on to Exhibit which would be your items 15 and 16, swabs of blood from Camo Benelli. Yes, item 15. Nature of the objection. Foundation, she described in, in the question as swabs of blood that has not been established. All right, response. Um, your, item, your Honor, item exhibit 256, item 15 and 16 have been admitted into evidence, even though I can't get my hands on them at the moment. And they were described as two swabs of suspected blood from receiver forward of the loading port from Camo Benelli Super Black Eagle 3 12 gauge shot. Uh, Your Honor, there'd be no objection if it was the question were rephrased to say suspected blood. All right, if you restate the question, please. I believe I misspoke, and this would be State's Exhibit 259. And what is that item? Um, 259 contains um, sled items 15 and 16, which were swabs um, from the Camo Bonelli 12 gauge shotgun. And did you analyze those, those items? Yes, I did. Okay. Based on your comparisons that you made, were any individuals included? For which item? Let's start with item 15. Item 15 was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. So for this comparison, we have the person being compared to the DNA profile and an unidentified, unrelated individual as the first scenario. And then the second scenario is two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. <coughs> For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the result is the DNA profile is approximately 670 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals <clears throat> contributed to the mixture. Um, for the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the result is, <clears throat> sorry, 
The DNA profile is approximately 10 quintillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And so now, because we have a mixture where more than one person has been included as a contributor, we run the statistic for those individuals together to make sure that the DNA profile can be explained by a contribution of DNA from all of those individuals together. So the comparisons would now be um, Margaret Murdaugh and Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed to the mixture versus two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And the result of that comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 48 quintillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed to the profile than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the profile. Okay, so we have three different, I guess, scenarios there? Three different comparisons being made. And is any one of those comparisons more likely than the other? How do you mean? Okay. Well, can you can you pick out one of those comparisons as being more likely than the other comparisons? Um, for each of those comparisons, um, the individuals who were being compared were included as um, contributors to the mixture. All right. Let's talk about item 16, which is also a swab of suspected blood from the Camo Benelli? For item 16, um, the partial DNA profile developed was insufficient for interpretation. All right, let's move on to exhibit 398. You'll take a look at 398. Three ninety eight contains our sled lab numbers um, twenty two point four and twenty two point five. So item twenty two point four is a reddish brown debris swab from the right side of the receiver belonging to item twenty two. Correct. Individuals included on that item 22.4. Um, 22.4, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. For the comparison with Margaret Murdaugh, the result was the DNA profile is approximately 480 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And what does that mean? Um, the result is in support of that first scenario um, of Margaret Murdaugh being included um, as a contributor to the mixture, um, the likelihood ratio is um, 480 octillion times more. The DNA profile is approximately 480 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then the next item, 22.5, is also a swab from that same shotgun from the left side? Yes. Okay. Based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? Item 22.5, um, the DNA profile was also interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. For the comparison with Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 570 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. 75 octillion times more likely that Margaret Murdaugh contributed to that mixture. 
The DNA profile is approximately 570 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdoch and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And now this unidentified unrelated individual is popping up and what does that mean again? It's just the way that we make our calculation. We have to account for an opposing scenario um, to the person being compared. And then when there is a mixture, we need to account for the other individuals in that mixture when we're making our comparison. And so we use an unidentified, unrelated individual. Did you um, analyze some swabs from Paul Murrell's cell phone? I believe that would be your item 25.1. Yes. And what were the results of your analysis there? A partial DNA profile was developed due to the limited information obtained and the inability to determine the number of contributors, no further interpretation will be offered. In State's Exhibit 83 is some swabs from a Chevy Suburban. If you could focus on your item 56, the two swabs of, of suspected blood collecting from the steering wheel. Let me try that. Is it 56? Okay. Okay, I have 56. <laughs> and you analyzed item 56? Yes, I did. Swabs of blood collected from the steering wheel? They were submitted as two swabs of suspected blood collected from the steering wheel of the Chevy Suburban. And based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? For item 56, um, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the result is the DNA profile is approximately 35 times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the result is the DNA profile is approximately 100 quadrillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then just like before, because we had two individuals who were included individually as contributors to the mixture, we have to run the comparison of them together to make sure that the DNA profile can be explained by a contribution of DNA from all of those individuals. So for that comparison, the DNA profile is approximately 240 quintillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. 
Um, there's also a statement that because um, that first comparison to Margaret Murdoch um, had a likelihood ratio result that is on the lower end of our scale, um, we want to put more emphasis on um, that result when comparing her as a contributor to the mixture. So the likelihood ratio for proposition set three, which was that comparison together, was calculated to confirm that the mixture could be explained by the contribution of DNA from all individuals listed under HP, which is that first scenario, due to the disparity in the individual likelihood ratios between the contributors for this item, it is recommended to put more weight on the results of Proposition Set 1, which was that comparison of Margaret Murdoch individually, rather than the results of Proposition Set 3, which is the comparison of them together, um, when considering Margaret Murdoch as a possible contributor to the mixture. This, this stuff's kind of confusing already, but I yeah. think that, that just got really confusing. <laughs> so if, I guess if you could sim kind of simplify that a little bit for us. Yes. So think about like two people singing the same song. If one person is singing really quietly and another person is singing loudly, when they're singing together, it'll sound really loud because that one person is already singing loudly by themselves. But that doesn't mean that the person who was singing quietly is suddenly singing very loudly. So we're trying to account for the difference in um, the weight of the result. And so it's just more accurate when considering that person who is a lower level um, or has a lower likelihood ratio um, to consider their individual likelihood ratio rather than the combined likelihood ratio. So what, based on all of that, what is the most likely we have there? It's not really that it's like a more likely scenario over another. It's just the result of that comparison that's being made. So just take into all that into account. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's move on to exhibit um, 251, which was the um, left and right fingernails from Maggie Myrtle. <coughs> Exhibit 251, did you analyze um, those items? I believe item 70 is the left fingernail clippings from Maggie Murdahl. Yes, and 71 is the right fingernail clippings from Margaret Murdahl. Well, let's talk about the left fingernail clippings first. Um, what were the results of your analysis? Are you looking for... Um, all of the individuals who are, who are compared? Yes, the, the results, the entire results. Yes. Okay. Um, for item 70, um, a DNA profile suitable for comparison was developed. Um, several individuals were visually excluded from the profile first. Um, Paul Murdaugh, Anthony Cook, Roger Davis, Rogan Gibson, Connor Cook, Philip Beach, Renee Beach, Robin Beach, John Murdaugh, Richard Alexander Murdaugh Jr. or Buster, Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Randy Murdaugh, Miley Altman, and Morgan Dowdy are excluded as contributors. Excluded. Excluded as contributors. Um, for the proposition set, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals um, because these are Margaret Murdaugh's own fingernail clippings. She is assumed as a contributor. Um, so the two scenarios are Margaret Murdaugh, um, and in this case, the comparison was made to Claude C.B. Rowe using um, the StarMix software. So that first scenario is Margaret Murdaugh and Claude C.B. Rowe contributed to the mixture, and the second scenario is Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. Okay. Now, why was Claude C.B. Rowe included in this comparison? So the other individuals I was able to visually exclude, which just means from looking at the DNA profile and comparing it to their standard, um, I could exclude them as a contributor. Um, if an individual um, happens to have the alleles that um, 
or if an individual cannot be visually excluded, um, so I cannot say from looking at their DNA profile, comparing it to the evidence that they are excluded, then I will run the statistic to compare them to that profile. And so that's why that comparison was made. Um, the result of the comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 11 times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Margaret Murdaugh and Claude C.B. Rowe contributed to the mixture. So this is a result in support of that second scenario. It's not the first scenario like the others that we've been discussing have been. So um, how much DNA were you looking at in this sample? Are you asking, like, DNA that was not attributable to Margaret? Well, I guess, was there a small amount of DNA or a large amount of DNA under those left fingernail clippings? Um, there was not a lot of, there were not many alleles um, that were not attributable to Margaret in the profile. So let's talk a little bit, explain about those alleles there that when you are doing your testing. Yeah. Um, like I explained earlier, the alleles are the results of our test, and they will appear on, um, in the profile that we're looking at. And they will be um, at different proportions based upon roughly um, how much DNA is present from the different possible contributors. So um, in this case, because there were Margaret Murdaugh's own fingernail clippings, um, her DNA is present in the profile um, at a higher level. And then we are looking at only a few alleles that were not her own alleles to make the comparison to the other individuals. So was it, was it three alleles? Yes, okay. that were not Margaret Murdaugh's alleles. And those three alleles could be C.B. Rowe's alleles? Um, I could not visually exclude him, which just means when looking at his profile and comparing it to those other alleles, um, he did have those alleles, but it's a very low level um, of DNA that's being compared to, um, to him. And the result was in support of um, that second scenario, which was um, Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And this courtroom here is full of people. Could anybody in this courtroom have those same three alleles present in that testing? It's possible. All right, let's move on. And let's put this um, other chart we have here on the screen. And the results concerning CB Road, um, was that moderate support for exclusion for his results? So what you're looking at is a scale. It's representative of a, ver a verbal scale that we have on our reports, and it's showing um, the different ranges for the likelihood ratio results that we can obtain. So on one side, you have the likelihood ratios that are in support of that first proposition, or that first scenario, and you on the other side, you have um, the scale for the results that are in support of that second proposition. So here, it the range is 2 to 99 for moderate support for that second proposition, and his result is N11, which so falls within that 2 to 99 range. Okay. 
And then the other result with just Margaret Murdoch? Um, for Margaret Murdoch, because it's her own fingernail clippings, we're not calculating a statistic. We're assuming her as the contributor. And you also analyze the fingernail clippings from her right hand. Yes. And those are up there as well. Um, what were the results of your analysis there? The DNA profile developed is attributable to Margaret Murdoch. And then um, states exhibit 252 is fingernail clippings from the right and left hands of Paul Murdoch. If you could tell us any results from your analysis of um, Paul's fingernail clippings. For both items 72 and 73, the result was the DNA profile developed is attributable to Paul Murdoch. Now you also analyzed um, Alec Murdahl's shirt, which is tape exhibit 418, your item 9. Um, Paul Murdoch, or excuse me, the defendant Alex Murdoch's pants as well. Yes, I received cuttings from both item 19, um, which was the white shirt um, from Richard Murdoch, and then item 20, which was a pair of green shorts from Richard Murdoch. Okay. And are the cuttings from the shirt and the shorts? In those two exhibits up there, take 460 and 461. This appears to be all of them. I can take them out and check, or if you would like for me to. <laughs> um, I believe that that should be all. Okay. And there were quite a few cuttings that you analyzed. Yes. Okay, so, unfortunately, we're going to have to go through all of those, the analysis of all of those cuttings. So let's start with the shirt in um, Exhibit 460, item 19.2, a cutting from the exterior front edge of Alec Murdahl's shirt, the defendant. Based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? For 19.2, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. For the comparison with Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 460 octillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Um, item 19.3, recording from the exterior back, bottom center of the defendant shirt. For 19.3, um, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. Um, for this item, I was able to assume um, Richard Alexander Murdoch as a contributor. So um, the propositions or the scenarios that we're comparing are Richard Alexander Murdoch and the person being compared versus Richard Alexander Murdoch and an unidentified, unrelated individual. Um, contributed to the mixture. Um, for the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 360 quadrillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Margaret Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. Item 19.4. Uh, 
Um, for 19.4, um, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals, and this was a situation where I had to first calculate the statistic for Richard Alexander Murdoch to see if there was enough DNA to condition on him as a contributor. Um, so for that comparison, the DNA profile is approximately 120 quadrillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdoch and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then moving forward, with the other comparisons, I can say that Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture, and just like before, we have Richard Alexander Murdaugh and the person being compared contributed to the mixture versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately seven octillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Paul Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And does that complete your analysis of that item? For 19.4? Yes. Um, I think that was the only one where there was um, inclusionary likelihood ratios. Okay. Yes. Let's move on to um, 19.5, a cutting from pane B on the chart. You could tell us about any inclusions. This item was also interpreted, um, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals and I was able to assume Richard Alexander Murdaugh as a contributor. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the result is the DNA profile is approximately um, 3,800 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Margaret Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. Uh, moving on to item 19.6, a cutting from stain C on the shirt. Okay. Um, tell us about um, any individuals that were included there. For item 19.6, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. Um, I was able to assume Richard Alexander Murdaugh um, as a contributor to the mixture, and so now we are comparing um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the individual being compared to the mixture, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 570 octillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And does that include your, um, the results of inclusion for that item? Yes. Um, item 19.7, a cutting from stain D. For item 19.7, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from four individuals. Um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture, so I was able to assume him. And so the comparison in this case will be Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the person being compared to the mixture, and two unidentified, unrelated individuals um, contributed to the mixture versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 1.9 quadrillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, 
and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and three unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. I also made a comparison to Nolan Tootin. Um, the DNA profile is approximately 480 septillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Nolan Tootin, and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and three unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And again, why was um, Nolan Tootin included in, this, in that comparison? Um, When looking at the evidence DNA profile, um, I was not able to visually exclude um, Nolan Tootin as a potential contributor to the mixture, and so I ran his likelihood ratio for um, comparison to that item. And then um, similarly to the other items where if an individual is included um, when you run their um, likelihood ratio on their own. Um, I also had to do the calculation for all of those individuals together to make sure that the DNA profile can be explained by a contribution of all of those individuals. So for that comparison, the DNA profile is approximately 450 duo decillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, Nolan Tootin and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Okay, um, item 19.8, cutting from another stain on the shirt, stain E. individuals that were included in your results, please. The DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. Uh, Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, um, the result is the DNA profile is approximately 590 million times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. 19.9, um, For item 19.9, a DNA profile was developed due to the inability to determine the number of contributors. No further interpretation will be offered. Item 19.10. For item 19.10, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 430 octillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Um, out of 19.11, which is a cutting from stain H. Um, explain any individuals who are included in your analysis. So for item 19.11, um, the only individual who had an inclusionary likelihood ratio, um, well, first the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. Um, for the comparison to Hippolyto Torres, the DNA profile is approximately 10 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Hippolyto Torres contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. So, um, with Mr. Torres, I guess if you look back at this chart and tell us where he would fall along there. Um, the likelihood ratio for his comparison, 
under those propositions was 10, which falls under our um, weak support for that first scenario. So would that be trending towards exclusion? It's on, um, it's in support of that first scenario um, on this side, the, the green side of the scale. On the green side? But it's 10. The, so that very first arrow um, indicates weak support for that um, scenario. The range is 2 to 99. And his likelihood ratio um, when compared to the DNA profile. The DNA profile is approximately 10 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Hippolyto Torres contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And I don't want you to repeat to repeat that same thing again, but could you kind of, um, I guess, clarify what that means? Um, when making my comparison to the evidence DNA profile, I was not able to visually exclude um, Hippolyto Torres as a possible contributor to the mixture, and so I ran the statistic um, for his comparison. And the result of that comparison is in support of the first um, scenario, um, the DNA profile is approximately 10 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Hippolyto Torres contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. So it's just tilting that seesaw 10 in that direction. Okay, we have two cuttings left from the shirt. Uh, item. 19.12 is a cutting from stain I. Um, based on the comparisons you made, were any individuals included? 19.12, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 1.3 nonillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Margaret Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And then item 19.13, a cutting from stain J of the defendant's shirt. Mm -hmm. For item 19.13, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 1.5 sextillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Um, so this is one where I was not able to assume um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh as a contributor, so I am comparing each person individually. Um, for the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 24 quintillion times more likely if Paul Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 29 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And like before, because there are multiple individuals who were included as contributors when compared individually, I have to calculate the statistic for them together. Um, for that comparison, the DNA profile is approximately 260 quindecillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh, Paul Murdaugh, and Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And similarly to that um, other item where there was an individual with a um, lower likelihood ratio, there is that statement about um, uh, 
the recommendation to put more weight on the results of proposition set three, which was the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh, um, rather than the results of proposition set four when considering Richard Alexander Murdaugh as a possible contributor to the mixture. All right. So um, in addition to this shirt being analyzed for DNA, um, Agent Wynn um, told the jury a little bit about it being um, tested for blood. Um, can you explain um, what you did to test this shirt for the presence of blood? Um, I was asked to perform a hematrace test on the cuttings from the shirt. Um, as Miss um, Wynn um, described, it's our confirmatory test for blood. It works similarly to a pregnancy test or a COVID test. Um, one line in the control area is a negative result. A line in the control area and the test area would be a positive result. And that is testing with hematrace? Yes. And what were the results of the hematrace testing on all of the items that you just discussed to the jury? Um, for items 19.2 through 19.13, the result was no human blood identified. And um, what could, what could, could you explain that to us? Um, we had presumptive testing for blood and then um, some other testing and then the hematrace which says there was no blood. So what, what does that mean? So presumptive tests are sensitive but not very specific. Um, like discussed earlier, there are possible um, false positives for presumptive tests. If we're requested to, we can perform a confirmatory test, which is more specific, but is less sensitive. Um, so and in your opinion, if there was blood on that shirt, could um, testing such as with LCV have diluted any blood on the shirt? Um, I am aware of some studies that have been performed on um, hematrace testing after LCV that suggests that there is a possible interaction um, with the LCV and the hematrace test um, and it is possible for there to be um, amounts of hemoglobin that would not be detected by the test that would give a negative result. Um, but the, re the results of my testing were negative. And um, as we've discussed, um, testing for blood and testing for DNA is different. Yes. All right. Um, you also te um, tested the defendant's pants? Yes. Did you test those in a similar manner to the way you would test the cuttings from the shirt? Do you mean for DNA? Yes. Yes. That would be State's Exhibit 418, the defendant's pants, and the cuttings items 46, or excuse me, Exhibit 460 and 461. Your items um, 20.2. Sorry. Sorry, wrong report. Okay. So I guess as, as briefly as we can, let's discuss um, some of the, the results from the cuttings from those pants. Um, item 20.2 is a cutting from the front left interior pocket of the defendant's pants. Um, were any individuals included? So for item 20.2, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. This was one where I calculated his likelihood ratio to see if um, I could condition on him as a contributor. So the result of that comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 140 quadrillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. 
And so then for the comparisons to the other individuals, um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture and the scenarios are Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the person being compared, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 5.1 sextillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 25 quintillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Paul Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And for the comparison of all those individuals together, the DNA profile is approximately two quindecillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and Paul Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. The next cutting is item 20.3, a cutting from stain A on the defendant's pants. For 20.3, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 94 septillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Right, 20.4, cutting from Stain G from the defendant's pants. If you could um, tell us if any individuals were included in that analysis. For 20.4, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 24 sextillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. Was that the only comparison for that item? That was the only... Inclusion? Yes, for that item. Let's move to the next one. I think that would be 20.5, a cutting from stain C from the defendant's pants. You can please tell us um, if any individuals were included. Um, for 20.5, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture. For the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 4.1 septillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Paul Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And I think we have three left. Um, item 20.6, a cutting from stain D from the defendant's pants. The DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. This was one where I was not able to assume um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh as a contributor, so I'm making the comparisons to each person individually. And you can't assume him, why? Um, when making that comparison, um, it seems that his DNA may be present, but at a low level, so I cannot um, assume him as a contributor. Um, so I would run his likelihood ratio to see if I could condition, but in this case it was not high enough to meet our threshold to condition, so I'm just comparing him to um, the profile like 
every other individual. Um, for the comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 930 quintillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual, oh, I'm sorry. The DNA profile is approximately 930 quintillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 38 quintillion times more likely if Paul Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 190 times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then we're calculating the statistic for all of those individuals together. The DNA profile is approximately 8.7 quindecillion times more likely if Margaret Murdaugh, Paul Murdaugh, and Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And there is that same statement about um, putting more weight on the individual likelihood ratio for Richard Alexander Murdaugh um, when considering him as a contributor rather than the combined. Um, item 20.7, hopefully that should be an easy one. For 20.7, a DNA profile was developed due to the inability to determine the number of contributors. No further interpretation will be offered. And then lastly, item 20.8, a cutting from stain F of defendant's pants. <coughs> For 20.8, the DNA profile was interpreted as a mixture originating from three individuals. I calculated the likelihood ratio for Richard Alexander Murdaugh to see if it met our threshold to condition on him as a contributor. The result for his comparison is the DNA profile is approximately 320 million times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture than if three unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then we're making comparisons to the other individuals. Um, I'm including him as a contributor. So Richard Alexander Murdaugh is contributing to the mixture for the comparisons Comparison to Margaret Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 2.6 sextillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. For the comparison to Paul Murdaugh, the DNA profile is approximately 17 quintillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh Paul Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. And then once again, we're calculating the likelihood ratio of all of those individuals contributing to the mixture together. The DNA profile is approximately 93, 93 quatuor decillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh, Margaret Murdaugh, and Paul Murdaugh contributed to the mixture than if Richard Alexander Murdaugh and two unidentified, unrelated individuals contributed to the mixture. All right. Now, as far as the shorts or defendant's pants go, did you do any confirmatory testing on those with hematrace? No, I did not. Um, exhibit 419 is the defendant's shoes, which is item 21. Um, and um, in Exhibit 460, I believe it's up here in some of this. Uh, it might be. 460. Okay. Um, can you tell us what is contained? If a cutting from the left shoe of uh, the defendant's shoes is contained in that exhibit? Uh, yes, 21.2 is part of this container. And did you um, analyze the cutting from that shoelace? Yes. Okay. And were any individuals included in your results there? 
The DNA profile was interpreted as single source for the comparison to Richard Alexander Murdaugh. The result is the DNA profile is approximately 410 septillion times more likely if Richard Alexander Murdaugh contributed the profile than if an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed the profile. And did you also um, get some swabs from a raincoat? Yes, I did. Exhibit 462, two swabs <coughs> from a blue raincoat, your items 173.2 and 173.3? Yes. Okay. And you analyze those items? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, item 173.2 from the raincoat appears to be swabs from the interior cuffs, collar, hood, and interior zipper areas and zipper pull of the blue raincoat. Um, could you tell us the results of your analysis of that item? Or no, swab? sorry. No DNA profile was developed. And then um, item 173.3, swabs from the side opening zipper area in both interior portions of exterior pocket of blue raincoat. A partial DNA profile was developed due to the limited information obtained and the inability to determine the number of contributors. No further interpretation will be offered. Okay, Agent Zapata, thank you so much for going through all that with us. Um, we have no further questions for you at this time. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll break for lunch now and resume at 2.30. Cross-examination. Good afternoon, Agent Zapata. Good afternoon. We've gone through a pretty long list of things that you did analysis on. Um, did you do any analysis on any clothing or, or anything from the victim's bodies other than Maggie Murdaugh's fingernail clippings? I analyzed um, Margaret Murdaugh's fingernail clippings, Paul Murdaugh's fingernail clippings, as well as their buckle swabs. <clears throat> and when you say their buckle swabs, that was simply to collect their DNA to perform analysis, is that correct? That was the known standard that I used to make comparisons, yes. And under uh, Maggie Murdaugh's left fingernail uh, clippings, did you, you found uh, unidentified male DNA? Um, foreign to Margaret Murdaugh, there um, were some alleles present, yes. Well, we say some alleles present. Was there DNA from an unrelated male under her fingernails? For item 70, yes, one of the alleles um, indicates a male um, contributor. And this was an unrelated male? For, do you mean unrelated as in unrelated? Well, like, let, let me strike that and rephrase. Uh, were Paul and Alec Murdoch excluded as contributors? Yes. So male DNA under her fingernails not from Paul, not from uh, Alec Murdoch. The foreign DNA to her, yes, they were excluded as contributors. Would it have been possible to perform any further analysis on this, a Y chromosome profile? It is possible, but because there were so many male um, individuals who were related 
um, to each other as standards that were submitted. Um, it was decided that that would not be um, the best course of action to continue analysis because um, the male, um, the Y chromosome testing that you're discussing is inherited um, along the males of a familial line, and so there will be no way to distinguish between um, any related people, any related males. Um, when I guess making this determination, were you all aware? I had you know, previous testimony that Maggie Murdoch had been to a nail salon late that afternoon. I did not have any information about that. No. So if her nails were quite clean coming to Moselle, she doesn't have a lot of opportunity to have contact with Objection, unrelated you know, males. I overrule the objection. So if her nails were clean coming to Moselle, it doesn't appear that she has much opportunity to have that kind of contact with unrelated males, does it? It could be DNA, you know, DNA under fingernails. You're picking up DNA anytime you touch an item potentially. Um, if she did get her nails done, it's possible that Somewhere at the nail salon, there was DNA that she picked up under her fingernails. We can't really tell you how or when the DNA got there, but at any point in time between getting her nails done and arriving home, she could touch an object and potentially DNA from that object could be under her fingernails, or she can touch an individual and their DNA be under her fingernails in that way. Are you familiar with something called CODIS? Yes. And what is CODIS? CODIS is um, a database that we use to enter um, unknown profiles from a crime to attempt to identify um, links between uh, different cases and also between individuals who maybe have been arrested or convicted of a crime. So it's a database that you can submit DNA samples to and see if you get a hit and can identify whose DNA it is? Correct. Um, was this unidentified, unknown male DNA found under Maggie Murdoch's fingernails submitted to CODIS? It was not because, like we explained earlier, there were only three alleles present that were foreign to her, and that does not meet the threshold of uh, information necessary to enter a profile into CODIS. And it was decided not to do this further Y chromosome uh, analysis on it? Correct. Is it unusual in your experience to not test the victim's clothing for DNA? It depends on the situation of the case. A situation where an unknown person has killed two people in close, you know, close um, point blank shootings? Um, it would depend on the question that you're trying to answer when you are processing the clothing. Typically, victims of gunshot wounds, their clothing will be saturated in their blood or there will be lots of their blood present. And so um, if you're looking for touch DNA from maybe an individual, we would need to know the specific area of interest to attempt to gather that touch DNA from because the potential blood from the victims would be on the clothing. So we need to be able to isolate a specific area. If that information is not known, then there's not very much that we can do with that clothing because there's just no specified area for us to test. What about their hands? Wouldn't their hands always be an area of interest? Again, it depends. If there is evidence of a struggle, then perhaps, which is why we would take the fingernail clippings. Um, if we don't know, then sometimes you take the fingernail clippings just to see if we can get some DNA from the fingernail clippings. But I and the one time, and that the one time something was taken from them, it revealed unknown, unidentifiable male DNA. A very partial, low-level profile. Four and two, Margaret. And you found uh, Maggie Murdoch's DNA on the uh, 300 blackout shell casings that were recovered. Is that correct? Are you referring to item 7.1? Yes. She was included as a contributor to that item, yes. And your report doesn't separate between individual shell casings, does it? No. Uh, and is your report consistent with one of those shell casings being found in physical contact with her body? 
I believe there was information from the crime scene that um, one of the shell casings was um, recovered from underneath her body. And is your report consistent with that, that DNA could be uh, transferred by physical contact? That's possible, yes. And for the, uh, the shot shells um, found um, in the feed room that had a presumptive uh, blood test positive, uh, you found Paul's DNA on those, is that correct? Um, Paul was included as a contributor to that item, yes, 10.1. And is that consistent with those being found in a room soaked with his blood? It would not be unexpected. And for the, the steering wheel of the Chevy Suburban, there was a positive human blood test, and I believe you found Maggie and Alex Murdoch's DNA on the steering wheel. For item 56? Yes. For item 56, um, which was a mixture was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals. Um, both Margaret and Richard Alexander Murdahl were included as contributors. So, yes. They were included as contributors. Yes. And is that consistent with someone who has handled um, uh, Margaret uh, Murdahl's deceased body, which is unfortunately covered in blood, and then driving the vehicle? can't ever tell you exactly how the DNA was deposited onto an item. I can just tell you what the DNA profile uh, and is. I'm not asking you to. I'm just asking, is, is it consistent? Is there anything in your report that would exclude that explanation? It's a possibility. And for the two shotguns, neither one of those had Paul's DNA. Is that correct? Can you give me an item I, number, I please? I can. Sorry, just a sec. The first one is item 15. Item 15 were swabs from the Camo Benelli 12 gauge shotgun from receiver forward of the loading port, and Paul Murdaugh was excluded as a contributor to that item. And the other shotgun was item 22. For 22.4, which was interpreted as a mixture originating from two individuals, Paul Murdaugh was excluded as a contributor. For item 22.5, um, due to the relatedness of the contributors, I was not able to offer a conclusion regarding Paul Murdaugh. So that's a situation that we talked about earlier where sometimes if there's a small amount of DNA present, we cannot distinguish between related individuals, and so I was not able to make any comparisons to Paul to that item. But you're not able to say for either one of those shotguns that Paul's DNA was detected? He was excluded as a contributor for 22.4. For 22.5, I couldn't make any comparisons to him either way. And again, is there anything in your test results that would be inconsistent with somebody who, with Alec Murdoch, having uh, Maggie Murdoch's blood on his hands, having just visited the crime scene and handling those two weapons? Again, I can't really say exactly how the DNA um, was deposited onto an item. And then later you did some uh, DNA testing on the white T-shirt he was wearing, correct? Yes. Um, did anyone ever tell you why you were being asked to perform those tests? Which tests do you mean? On the, his white T-shirt. The DNA analysis on the T-shirt? So the DNA one. DNA. It was submitted with a request to um, for DNA. Um, for blood, and so when items come in with a request for DNA blood, we will um, test it. 
Um, if it is presumptive positive, then we'll move forward with DNA analysis on that item. So did anyone say we believe he's wearing this shirt that night? Is that why you're testing it for blood? Just to see if that, right? Someone's asking you to do this work. Did anyone say we think he was wearing this shirt that night during these murders? Let's test it for DNA and for blood. I know that the shirt was removed from his body when it was collected. Mm -hmm. As far as when he was wearing the shirt, I don't have any information about that. We pull up what's been previously admitted as the uh, Defense Exhibit 32. Okay. You recognize this, correct? Yes. And this shows this shows where the, the cuttings were, were made from the shirt, right? The A, B, C, D, E. Yes. Okay. And just kind of going through very quickly, cutting A down here in the bottom, did you find uh, Maggie or Paul's DNA in cutting A? Cutting A? Is item 19.4? Yes. For 19.4, Margaret Murdoch was excluded as a contributor and um, Paul Murdoch was, Paul, Paul Murdoch was included as a contributor. So we have Paul and A and B. Did you find Maggie or Paul? For item 19.5, Paul was excluded as a contributor, um, and Margaret Murdaugh was included as a contributor. And for C, which is going up a bit, so now we're off the bottom of the shirt, did you find Maggie or Paul? For item 19.6, Again, I was not able to make any comparisons to Paul um, due to the relatedness of the contributors. But Margaret was included as a contributor to that mixture. Okay. For cutting D, now we're up at the right shoulder. Did you find uh, Maggie or Paul there? For item 19.7, I could not make any comparisons to Paul due to the relatedness of the contributors. And Margaret was included as a contributor to the mixture. And did you also find Nolan Tutin from D? He was also included as a contributor to the mixture. Going over to the other shoulder, did you find Maggie or Paul in E? For 19.8, um, Paul Murdaugh was excluded as a contributor. And Margaret Murdaugh was included as a contributor to the mixture. Okay. So no Paul but Maggie there. Now coming down all the way to the bottom, G. Did you find Maggie or Paul there? Um, Paul was excluded as a contributor to the mixture. Now finally for both F and H up here, did you get any results for either one of those? For 19.10, Margaret was also included as a contributor. Sorry, just to finish that result. Sorry, sorry. Um, you were asking about? F and H, did you get any results for either one of those? Um, for F, which was our item 19.9, 
Um, a DNA profile was developed, but due to the inability to determine the number of contributors, no further interpretation will be offered. For H, which is our item 19.11, Paul was excluded as a contributor. And for Margaret, um, the comparison to Margaret, an uninformative statistical result was obtained. No conclusion can be made regarding Margaret Murdaugh as a possible contributor to the mixture under the list of propositions, um, which in this case the propositions were um, Richard Alexander Murdaugh and Margaret Murdaugh contributed to the mixture versus Richard Alexander Murdaugh and an unidentified, unrelated individual contributed to the mixture. And that's a situation I described earlier where the seesaw is balanced, so it can't tell me in either direction which scenario is a better explanation of the DNA profile. So the only part of the, the shirt that we see right here at the front where you can say that you did find Paul's DNA is down here at A, the bottom right part of the shirt, correct? Don't, don't see. For item A, I did have an inclusionary likelihood ratio for Paul. For several of the other stains, there was, um, I could not distinguish between him and other related individuals, so I could not make comparisons to him. But the only place you de definitely did find Paul was A, is that correct? On the front of the shirt. That was the only item where there was an inclusionary likelihood ratio for Paul. Do you remember when you did this, when you reported these DNA results? Do you know the date? Are you asking specifically for yeah, the, the date that you reported your, your results for the shirt, for DNA? For the shirt. Um, there were two reports that um, had the shirt because there were two times that it was processed originally. Um, the first report, which had the results for item 19.2, was June 25th, 2021. And then the second report um, was originally issued July 25th, 2021. July 25th, 2021. On July 26th, the day after, did you attend a meeting uh, with um, President was uh, Major Huey. I apologize if I'm not saying the names correctly. Captain uh, Riley, Captain Reinhardt, Lieutenant Wallace, Lieutenant Shank, Lieutenant Hash, yourself, and uh, Mindy Worley. Did you attend that meeting? Yes, I did. And uh, was the purpose of that meeting to discuss the DNA report? Yes, it was to explain the results of my report. Um, were you at that meeting asked to perform hematrace tests? Not at that meeting, no. Okay. When were you asked to perform hematrace tests on the shirt? August 10th, 2021. And is that the day that you performed them? Yes. 
Yeah, I think you previously testified your test results were negative. Correct. Yeah. Can you tell us a little more how you did. Well, let me ask it this way: to perform the test, did you make smaller cuttings from the larger sh uh, shirt cuttings? Yes. So I took the um, cuttings, opened them, and then cut small portions of the larger cuttings to test for hematrace, and then place those cuttings into a uh, solution, and then that solution is added to each individual card for that individual cutting. So there's a test performed for each item. I'm going to show you a series of photos, if I may, mm -hmm. ask if you can identify them. Um, this is what's been previously marked and the, the marks are on the back. This can be confusing. As Defense Exhibit 96, do you recognize that? I apologize. Do you recognize the, uh, the photograph? Yes. And that's one of the uh, cuttings after you made the, the small cuttings? Can I see the other? It's hard to tell which was before and which was after without the other cuttings because there's cuttings for DNA and then I cut along the cuttings for DNA for the hematrace test. Yeah, I don't have before and afters to show you. Would it perhaps be helpful to look at some of the other ones? Would that help you? Yes. I'm going to show you what's been marked. I'm going to read these off and so I can give them all to you at one time. If that's okay. okay. That might help you. Yes. Uh, been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 97. You recognize them? Yes. And these are the um, the larger cuttings with the smaller cuttings made after the hematrace test. I know that we took photos before the cutting was taken for hematrace and after. It's hard to tell from these pictures if it was before or after, but they were taken during the hematrace processing of the shirt. Okay. I would offer defendants exhibits 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, and 105. Is that it? No objection, Your Honor. They're admitted without objection. Permission to publish. May I publish? You don't need my permission to publish anything that's in evidence. Who would bring up? Go get the uh, the whiteboard, please. 
So in this one, it looks like you made five cuttings, is that correct? So some of these cuttings were originally taken for DNA. Um, I tried when I cut for hematrace to also cut along where the cuttings were taken for DNA. Okay, so, so but there's five there, right? Yes. Okay. The next one. And let's see if we can count how many are here. It looks like 14. It's a little hard to see the very small ones. It's hard to tell okay, we on can the small it. screen. If you're not sure, don't count it. So 14? No, no don't, don't do that. It looks like 14. Okay. Uh, next, uh, next exhibit. Here. Eight. Okay. Next one. Seven. Nine. The next one. Seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. Next exhibit. Looks like nine. It's again, it's a little hard to see. But again, be conservative. Don't count one if you're not sure. The next exhibit. Four. Next one. Nine. Next one. Two. That's it. Those are all of them. So now we'll just add add these numbers up. Uh, I have a calculator for those. Plus 14, plus 8, plus 2, plus 7, plus 9, plus 7, plus 9, plus 4, plus 9. So what's the total? 74. 74. And in your test, on none of these did you detect human blood with hematrix. Is that correct? For all those cuttings for the different items, um, they were all put together into that tube for that item. Um, and for all of those tests, the result was negative. Okay. 
So we're over 74 in detecting human blood here. The result was negative. Moving on, then on August 16th, did you attend a meeting to discuss DNA results or outstanding DNA reports? Yes. Were these results discussed at that meeting? For that meeting, we were discussing the items that were um, that still had pending DNA um, assignment, so that they had submitted for DNA analysis, and we were waiting to see if that analysis was still required. Um, there's nothing in the discussion about those results being um, discussed. I don't remember anything else about that meeting. Let me ask this. Who, who asked you to perform the hematrace test on August 10th? Um, there was the request for the hematrace result was relayed to me by my supervisor. And, and who's your supervisor? Um, Lieutenant Laura Hash. And on August 10, did you relay to Lieutenant Hash the results of your uh, tests? She was actually the reviewer of my hematrace test. So when we perform card tests, there needs to be a second analyst um, to review the card test and sign off on the review of the test. So she was present when the test was performed. In uh, 2021, were you ever informed that SLED was uh, seeking a blood spatter analysis of the shirt? I was told after the shirt had been sent that it was going to be sent for um, blood spatter analysis, but I don't know anything about how that came about or where it was being sent to. That was once I was done with my analysis. When you say when the, after the shirt was sent, what, what do you mean by that? Or however they did the um, blood spatter analysis, I know that there is documentation that um, the shirt was being taken for that in the narrative, but I don't know how that came about. And at that time, I guess I'm a little confused, were you aware at that time that it was being sent for blood spatter analysis? Not until it was already sent. And by sent, you mean that somebody had asked for the report to be made or that the shirt had physically been sent somewhere? I don't, I don't know anything about how it how the blood spatter analysis came to be. I don't know what they required for that analysis. Okay, well, could you just tell me a date the first time you learned that there was going to be a blood spatter analysis? Even a month if you don't know the exact date? I really don't know because it didn't have anything to do with me or my analysis. When was the first time um, your hematrace test appeared on a report that you issued? The report with the hematrace results was issued on November 10th, 2021. Were the uh, results for the uh, blue raincoat also on that report? Yes, they were. Okay. Did you discuss the hematrace test results with uh, anyone working on this case? I don't think that I discussed it with anybody else. I don't think so. I would have discussed it with the person who reviewed the results. Did you discuss the blue raincoat results with anyone investigating the case, any agents on the investigative side? I know for the raincoat, um, I was asked to give an update on when the results are, would be issued. Um, once I developed the DNA profiles for those items, um, the DNA profiles were technically reviewed, and then um, I was able to um, make a phone call 
um, to relay those results. And I was able to speak to Agent Ghent and just give him the um, preliminary results for the items from the raincoat. But you did not discuss the hematrace results that are on the same re same report? According to my notes, I only updated him on the findings from the rain code. Let's move ahead then to uh, March 22nd of 2022. Uh, I just said that you were aware at some point that a blood spatter report had been requested. Were you aware in, in March that one had been received claiming that there was high velocity uh, impacts blood spatter on the shirt? Were you aware of that report? I didn't really know anything about the report or the results of the report. Um, so you weren't aware of it in March 2022, is that correct? I don't know when. I really do not remember when I was told or what. I know that I didn't really get much information about the report or when. Okay. Well, moving in a little further then, um, on April 11, 2022, the Attorney General requested a meeting that occurred on April 20th, you know, nine days later, to discuss uh, reports. Yes. And in preparing for that meeting on the 20th, did you access your November 10 report on April uh, 18 and April 19, a couple days before that meeting? I mean, did I look at the report in preparation yes. for the meeting? I, I would have reviewed okay. the reports in preparation for the meeting, yes. At that meeting, uh, was any, there any discussion of blood spatter? I do not remember. Okay, this is the, the first meeting with the AG's office after the report is received saying that there is blood spatter. Was it but discussed? that had nothing to do with my testing, so I don't really know. Did you notice uh, that six days after that meeting there were media reports that uh, high velocity impact spatter had been found in Mr. Murdoch's t-shirt? I tried very hard to not look at any media reports involving this case at all, so I tried to avoid that information. Well, at, at some point, did someone come to you and ask uh, about the hematrace uh, test results that you performed that say no human blood, 0 for 74, in relation to this report seeing that there was blood spatter that had to come from a gunshot on the T-shirt? At some point, I know that we discussed the um, hematrace results on the shirt. And when, would that, when was that? It probably would have been in the meeting where we went over all of the results of my reports. I know that we had several meetings to discuss the results of my reports. Can, any, any idea when that was? It does appear that that April meeting was the first meeting after that report was issued um, where we had a discussion about the reports. So it would have been that meeting that had been discussed, your hematrace test results and the blood spatter report discussed in the same meeting? Possibly, but I don't know that. I also wasn't present for all of the meetings all of the time. I know there were some times when um, there were meetings with specific individuals first, and then I would come later, so I don't remember if 
there was specific discussion of blood spatter there when I was present. Handing you what's been marked as Defendant's Exhibit 95, do you recognize that? Yes. Um, it is a memorandum to the file for this case. And, and you're the author of this memorandum? Yes. And it concerns hematrace and it relates to this case? Yes. I was asked to um, do some research into the scientific literature um, to see if there was information about hematrace and potential um, effects of other kinds of testing prior to hematrace as well as um, list some reasons for possible negative um, hematrace results. Uh, Your Honor, I would offer a Defendant's Exhibit 95 into evidence. Says the State. No objection, Your Honor. Submitted without objection. Were you asked to write this uh, memo? Yes. Uh, who asked you to do this? Um, Creighton Waters asked for me to um, do this research and then summarize um, my findings in a, the form of a memo. Did he tell you why he was asking you to do this? Um, because there were negative hematrace results in this case from the shirt, he wanted um, just some more information on negative hematrace results. Was it specifically because of the report saying high velocity impact spatter? I don't know that. Was that discussed when he asked you to do this? We discussed the negative hematrace results on the shirt. Did you discuss a report by a man named Tom Devil? I don't think we specifically discussed the results of that report because I don't know. I'm not a blood spatter expert. I don't know anything about what that report would say or what the findings in that report would mean. I just know that there was a report and then I was asked to um, give some more information on hematrace. Were you um, aware of a report by Tom Bevel specifically regarding use of hematrace on things that uh, had been previously tested with LCB? I was made aware of a report like that um, after I had already, um, obviously it was after my analysis had been complete. Um, I don't remember specifically if it was before or after um, I was asked to uh, write this memo. And you attached some uh, um, articles to this memo, correct? Yes, I attached the articles that I found regarding hematrace so that um, all that information would be present in the memo. And this first article from the Australian Journal of Forensic Sciences, am I characterizing it correctly to say that it reports that hematrace tests are generally effective after, um, after treatment with LCB? For that article, um, there were many tests performed um, comparing um, testing hematrace after the use of um, several other kinds of tests beforehand. Their results um, were positive following LCV um, for 17 out of 17 tests with a blood dilution of 1 to 10 and for 16 out of 18 tests with a blood dilution of 1 to 100. So it usually works, hematrace, when you're testing something that had a presumptive test with LCB. Correct. Right. It shows that it does, it um, did work the majority of the time that they tested it, but they did obtain two negative results as well. Out of how many total? out of 17 plus 18. Okay. So it, it didn't work two out of 18 times? Um, turn this on. Okay. 
uh, of the 35 times they tested it, um, they obtained a positive result 33% of the time, according to the article. Sorry. 33 times, sorry, so what, according to the article. What's the percentage of that? Uh, it looks like 94 percent. 94 percent. And here we're at zero for 74. Mm -hmm. On the next article, on page four of the next article, there's a little chart. Do you see what I'm talking about? Which article? In the exhibit, the second article, page four. chart correctly to, to understand it to mean that hematrace uh, detects blood at dilution levels in which LCV would not detect blood? Um, ac according to this study, um, which was performed by the Michigan State Police, um, they were able to obtain positive hematrace results um, for some samples that were negative um, LCV. So the hematrace test is more sensitive than LCV, at least according to this study, correct? It appears to be. According to this study, um, LCV is not a chemical that I use in the DNA casework department. It is a um, test that's performed by the crime scene unit, so they would be the best people to answer questions about sensitivity of that test. According to this, you would get a positive result even if you couldn't see anything with LCV. According to the previous study, after LCV, 94%, and here we're over 74. Is it fair to say that there's no human blood on the T-shirt? Like I said earlier, the test that I performed um, was negative for the presence of human blood. Could we pull up 32 again? This will be very quick. Zoom in on the pocket. Sorry, I don't have a, an image of the back of it. But I believe this is the name of a fishing boat, and there's a fishing boat on the back of the T-shirt. Were you aware when doing this that this is a fishing T-shirt? No. Um, have you ever gaffed a fish? I don't even know what that word means, no. <laughs> well, let me ask it this way, Ben. If someone were doing something while wearing this T-shirt that would cause non-human blood to spray onto the shirt, could that be a reason why something would have a misting pattern with LCV and test negative for hematrace, you know, 0 for 74? I can't really answer anything about the misting pattern because that is not my area of expertise, but um, one possibility for um, a negative hematrace test is um, that the blood present on the item is not human blood because um, hematrace is a confirmatory test for the presence of human blood. It also reacts to ferret blood and higher primate blood. Does it really, um, react to fish blood, does it? No. Did you attend an evidence viewing meeting on January 5th of this year? Yes, I did. Was blood spatter discussed at that meeting? I know that we talked about um, the results of the shirt. As far as blood spatter, again, I'm not a blood spatter analyst, so I cannot give any information about blood spatter on an item of clothing or on anything. 
specifically were reports by Tom Bevel, excuse me, Bevel, discussed at that meeting? I really do not recall. Just, even though it was just this month, well, last month, time's flying. Yeah, it's hard to remember specifics. The reports by uh, a Deputy Kinsey discussed regarding blood spatter. I don't recall that name at all. Was the t-shirt discussed? I don't remember the exact items that were um, discussed specifically. Has anyone, I'm going to ask this, it looks like there's been a lot of work done on this t-shirt. Yes. And that's fair, right? Yes. Put a lot of work into this t-shirt. Um, there were the little cuttings in the beginning, the small ones in the hem, right? And then those are uh, tested with uh, pheno... Phenothaline. Right. And then DNA tested. All of these large cuttings, we haven't even gone over, there were a couple in the back of the shirt as well. All these small cuttings. Then you went back and made more small cuttings for the hematrace, right? Lots of work, and then you're doing this, this big memo about hematrace because of the shirt, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of work, and this is going on from a period of June 21, the month of the murders. It looks like all the way up until a month before trial. Is that fair? Well, well my, an shirt. my analysis was complete um, before that, but... but... I mean, you're doing this memo to file because of the shirt results, correct? Um, yes, correct. Yeah. So I mean, it's so for all this t all this work on this shirt, um, it appears that the theory was that he was wearing that shirt that night. Same. Just ask uh, maybe this: the meetings that you've attended, where the shirt was discussed, blood spatter was perhaps discussed. Was there ever any discussion of a blue button-down shirt? Not that I recall. Never discussed. Okay. Fed the courts indulge. I know you said it's not your area, but are you familiar with the term high velocity impact spatter? Not really. Do you, do you even know what that is? No, I'm not a blood spatter expert. Would you think that you could have blood spatter without blood? Uh, no further questions, Your Honor. Any redirect? Yes, I do. And are you aware that before you analyzed this shirt that there were um, presumptive positives for blood? Yes. Okay. And then when you analyzed the shirt with the hematrace, what were your findings? Uh, the hematrace results were negative. All right. Um, the defense also asked you about um, touch DNA. When you analyzed those cases and shot shells that were found at the scene, what were you analyzing those items for? For item 7.1, um, the request was for um, touch DNA analysis 
for items 9 and 10, the request was also for touch DNA analysis, but because um, the, there was staining on the swabs when um, Rachel Wynn did her processing, um, she presumptively tested those swabs and they were presumptively positive for blood and so they were forwarded for DNA analysis. But for touch DNA on items like that, would you be looking for possibly who ever loaded those items into a gun? <laughs> Whose other DNA could you be looking for when you're analyzing those cases for DNA? Typically when um, cartridge cases or shotgun shells are submitted for touch DNA, we are looking for DNA of an individual who may have handled those cartridge cases or shotgun shells. And is it common to find touch DNA on fired cases or shot shells? In my experience, um, there has not been a very good yield of DNA on those items. From my understanding, when um, a bullet is fired, it is being put through a lot of intense heat um, as it's moving through the firearm. At least that's how firearms um, analysts seem to explain the process. And so um, the heat can affect the recovery of DNA from that item. And um, also with touch DNA, Do you know when touch DNA gets some? No, I can never say how or when DNA was deposited on an item. So if I shook somebody's hand at some point in the day, could I have their DNA on my hand? It's possible, yes. And you would know when that got there? No. Um, now, do you determine what evidence is analyzed in a case? Do you look at all the evidence and pick and choose what you're going to analyze? Um, no, we are requested to analyze items of evidence. So some requests for you to analyze evidence. Correct. Who ever requested for you to analyze the clothes of Maggie and Paul Murdoch? I was never requested to analyze those items. And do you analyze items that you've not been requested to analyze? No. Thank you. Is it common to find touch DNA on an object when that object is discovered touching a person? Can you repeat that question? If an object is found actually touching a deceased person, would it be uncommon to find that deceased person's touch DNA on that object? No. And would it be uncommon to find a wife's uh, touch DNA on a husband's shirt? It would not be uncommon, no. No further questions. Step down. <laughs>